Thank you for coming here today to honor three veterans that served above and beyond their call to duty. I'm Dr. John Hofer, and I want to thank everyone for traveling near and far from several states for the ceremony today. How many people traveled out of states? I know we got, I thought the Dickerson's all over the Monroe. <laughs> I know the Morgans are bringing uh, family in, okay. Uh, color guard? Post colors. Thank you. Dave Kies, can you come up here and uh, we're going to start the Pledge of Allegiance. Don Heiliger, would you like to come up here for Pledge of Allegiance? These are two good friends of mine I've, I've got to meet as a provider here at the hospital. Dave Kies served with the 173rd Airborne, was wounded uh, severely. His name is actually on the wall by mistake in Washington. Don Heiliger, Colonel Heiliger, is a former uh, inductee in the Hall of Heroes, and I know Don holds the Pledge of Allegiance very closely uh, during his time with uh, Kane, Kane County Counters, County Supervisor. So, uh, could you just provide us with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Chaplain? This is uh, Chaplain Reverend Eugene Heckel, U.S. Navy retired commander. I got to meet recently, and I appreciate you doing that. Thank you, John. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we just come before you this day. We can see Jim here. I know you see him here. And I know, I think, I believe you've got Josh and Harry with you, looking down, pointing out family, pointing out friends. We just thank you for the gift of these men, that they have come to be here to defend your country and to defend the gift that you've given us this country to live in freedom and to live with you and to walk with you always. I ask you, Lord, as we're here today, for just to receive the gift and honor that we bestow upon them, the gift that they have given to us, to walk with us and to be with us and to protect us. At the same time, Lord, we ask you, Lord, for you to be with all of the servicemen and women, wherever they may be, that you will touch them, protect them, walk with them as they defend this country that you have given us. So be with us today as we honor these men, to know that you are honoring them with us, and to know that they have not given their lives in vain, because you have honored them and you're walking with them as you walk with us each day. And we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Please be seated. This is
is my uh, V8 teleprompter. It has been a while since we held the last Hall of Heroes induction ceremony. Golf companies, Marines, who have been a proud and important part of the color guard since I brought the Hall of Heroes to Madison around the first deployment during the last ceremony held in 2005. Since that time, they have returned from their second deployment. Some were wounded and are still healing, but sadly, some also have died. No matter what anyone calls it today, we are still in a long war on terrorism that seems to never end. With such a long war, sometimes the daily sacrifices of the troops and hardships for their families are taken for granted. Our troops' bravery and dedication, as well as the sacrifices of veterans from other wars, are not forgotten today and will never be forgotten as long as we continue to remember and honor them. I want to thank all the troops that serve and protect us today and also thank their families. Today, this ceremony celebrates our heroes' lives their incredible bravery and achievements. I hope their families today are comforted by the continuing honor we provide with our hospital's Hall of Heroes. I uh, now have Mr. Alan Akers come up and uh, give you a welcome from hospital leadership. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Department of Veterans Affairs and our director, Deborah Thompson, I want to welcome you all here today to our Hall of Heroes induction ceremony. Before I get started, I'd like to recognize a couple of special guests that we have. Karen Ramsey, representing Senator Russ Feingold's office. And we have Kathy Trevally. I think I saw you walk in. There you are. Kathy Trevally, representing Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin's office. We really appreciate your support. Thank you. And I, I'm not going to leave the podium without first thanking Dr. Hofer for setting up this whole program. The Hall of Heroes is really his brainchild. He's the architect of our program. And it has really blossomed over the years. We're especially proud of the new location for our Hall of Heroes out the door and just down the hallway here on the first floor. I can't tell you how many more people I see stopping to read the inscriptions on those plaques and to look into the faces of the people we've honored. It's really a wonderful program, so thank you, John. Thank you. As we were preparing for today's event, I was reminded of something that President John F. Kennedy said. He said, a nation reveals itself not only by the men and women that it produces, but it reveals itself by the men and women that it honors, by those it remembers. In other words, what he's saying is, we reveal our character by the people that we hold up as role models. So today, we proudly induct three new role models into our Hall of Heroes. We do this as a nation so that we can recognize the contributions and the sacrifices these people made in service to their country and in service to us. We do this as an organization, as employees of the Department of Veterans Affairs, to remind us of the noble mission we have here, providing health care to America's heroes. And we do it as individuals because they show us how to be better human beings. One more point I'd also like to make. It's important to remember that service to our country is not the sole domain of the men and women in the military. But it can also be found, it can be found in the uncertain world in which their families find themselves as they wait anxiously at home for their loved ones in uniform to return. So for those of you who, born that, who have borne that battle, we also have our greatest appreciation and thanks. So again, thank you all for coming today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the program as we induct three new role models into our Hall of Heroes program. Thanks.
also like to recognize some past honorees. Uh, Bob Botts, Silver Star World War II, United States Marine Corps. Bob uh, moved down to uh, Arizona, and I think he forgot that it's spring in Wisconsin. He can come back now. <laughs> Jim Stevenson, another one of my uh, friends that I've got to know uh, both as a provider and uh, working with you with the Hall of Heroes. Jim, would you please stand? And he was hiding in the back, and I had to get him down here. He's a Navy Cross recipient. And if you're not aware, Navy Cross and Distinguished Service Cross are both decorations that are just ranked below Medal of Honor. He uh, earned his Navy Cross on Iwo Jima, but it seems like he brags more about the times that he spent with Hugh O'Brien, the actor, that was Wyatt Earp when they were in Camp Pendleton together. <laughs> He's a very humble guy. Colonel Don Heiliger, would you please stand? <laughs> Don goes back uh, a long ways. After I transferred here, I was so excited to uh, really an honor to uh, meet a POW from Vietnam since I was a combat medic in Vietnam. Don and I just have fun and we have to take five minutes after the appointment just to catch up. Uh, Don uh, was held as a POW almost six years in North Vietnam and he's a Silver Star recipient. And Don, if I got this right, you started your military career with the Army National Guard. And then you saw the light and joined the Air Force. <laughs> Uh, people who know me probably know that I kind of kid the, the Air Force, but not when they're shot down and, and held like this. Jim and Agnostopoulos, I'm finally able to pronounce your name correctly. Opa. Jim has also became a very good friend. He served with the 173rd Airborne in Vietnam, and he received this Distinguished Service Cross. And you read his citation, and I think uh, he deserves a Medal of Honor. It, it's amazing. And he's just another low-key veteran that uh, never brags, and he's, he's become a good friend. Jim, his selection. <laughs> Sadly, some of our heroes from the Hall of Heroes have passed on since the last ceremony. James Duncan passed away shortly after the ceremony, and his wife died shortly after James passed away. David Brenzel recently passed on. He always had a smile when we would see each other in the hospital. His wife Mary, and please stand up Mary, I was glad to see you. And your daughters. Uh, David passed away. Mary sent me a nice card. And I had a laugh, even though it was shortly after his uh, loss, her loss, that she shared the story that he insisted when he came into the hospital, he would joke around and insist that he had to check his frame for the Hall of Heroes, make sure it's dusted. <laughs> And when we had them in the other locations, I'd walk by too, and sometimes the darn things would be tilted and, and everything. We've got them locked now, so <laughs> that won't occur. And, and David also had this uh, that was shared with me that uh, he was afraid of when he passed on that uh, we would take his picture down. And that would never happen, not, not as long as I'm here at the VA. And David had that kind of humor, which I think helped him overcome some of the terrible ordeals that he endured as a POW with the Japanese. I bet James Duncan and David Brenzel are still telling a few stories 
to their friends in heaven. I wish they were both here today to see the new frames and lighting that I think just is wonderful. And it highlights their accomplishments, and I can assure everyone they will be dusted regularly. <laughs> Our guest speaker, this was, uh, I might have missed a page on that teleprompter. Telephone. Our guest speaker today is Brigadier General Mark Anderson, Deputy Adjutant General, Wisconsin Army National Guard. And I use my VA issued bifocals. But then I use some glasses also that I bought at the canteen because they're even more powerful. And then we have our dental loops. If you see me walking around the hospital, I, can, I don't know who you are if, I, if I'm wearing those, but I can see your teeth good. <laughs> Brigadier General Mark Anderson is Wisconsin's Deputy Adjutant General for the Army. As such, he commands the Wisconsin Army National Guard and is responsible to the Adjutant General for all aspects of its mission performance. General Anderson earned his bachelor's degree in water resources, and I bet you had nothing to do with Lake Delton, from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in 1986. He is a 1985 graduate of the Wisconsin Military Academy and has completed the artillery officer basic and advanced courses. Army Command and General Staff College and the Army War College. He earned a Master of Strategic Studies degree from the Army War College Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania in 2002. General Anderson enlisted in the U.S. Army Reserve in 1983. After transferring to the Wisconsin Army National Guard and attending the Wisconsin Military Academy, he was commissioned a second lieutenant, and I love second lieutenant, sir. And he served in 1st Battalion, 120th Field Artillery as a fire support officer, firing battery commander, intelligence officer, Fire Direction Officer, Operations Officer, and Battalion Commander. He has also served as a 32nd Brigade Fire Support Officer as Assistant Operations and Training Officer, State Area Command as Infantry Brigade. He recently served one year with the Multinational Security Transition Command, Iraq, as a Senior Military Transition Team Advisor to the Iraqi Army at the Anumanaya Boy, you know, this war's going on. We're, we're almost starting to pronounce these names right. Training base. And that is a very critical role. Because if we cannot train the Iraqi army adequately, we're never going to be able to get our troops home. So I'm sure you have some information uh, about how that is going. And upon his return, he commanded the 32nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team from December 2006 until assuming his present position March 1, 2008. General Anderson's military awards include the Bronze Star Medal, Meritorious Service Medal with two Oak Leaf Clusters, the Army Commendation Medal with three Oak Leaf Clusters, Army Achievement Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, Army Reserve Components Achievement Medal with one Silver and one Bronze Oak Leaf Cluster, the National Defense Service Medal with Bronze Service Star, the Iraq Campaign Medal with two Bronze Service Stars, Global War on Terrorism Service Medal, Joint Meritorious Unit Award with Oak Leaf Cluster, and the Armed Forces Reserve Medal with Hourglass and M Devices, as well as other federal and state awards. General Anderson has been awarded the Combat Action Badge and is a recipient of the Military Order of St. Barbara for Artillery and St. Maurice Centurion Infantry. Infantry and Artillery really go together. General Anderson lives in Wisconsin Rapids, and I, my intel is he's really a good guy. <laughs> so General Anderson, please. Uh... Well, good afternoon, everybody. I had to, uh, as Don was reading that, I had to check my pulse because I wasn't sure if that was a eulogy or what. But uh, wasn't expecting that long, to be honest. But. Uh, distinguished guests, fellow veterans, and most importantly to Lieutenant John Morgan and the family members of Staff Sergeant Harry Dickerson and Sergeant Josh Brennan, 
Thanks for inviting me to, to attend today's induction of these three Wisconsin heroes into the Hall of Heroes. Of, over the course of America's history, millions of men and women have bravely answered the call, some more than once, in order to defend the freedoms which we hold so precious. Many of those heroes paid the ultimate price, while others returned home to continue their roles as citizens of this great nation, not asking for special recognition, but very deserving of it. Since 9-11, our armed forces have once again answered the call of the nation and have continued to serve faithfully. Wisconsin has sent over 14,000 men and women of the National Guard and Reserves and countless more on active duty to Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11. 109 service members have paid that ultimate sacrifice and over 27,000 since Wisconsin became a state. Currently, the Wisconsin National Guard has over 3,500 soldiers and airmen deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere around the world, including the 3,200 soldiers of the 32nd Infantry Brigade Combat Team. Many of these soldiers are on their second, third, fourth, and even one on his fifth deployment in the service of our country. That fifth deployment is, my, is our Command Sergeant Major, Vietnam veteran, who volunteered for this last deployment, even though he was scheduled to retire in one month. We had to get a special exception from the Secretary of Defense in order to mobilize him. It says something about the character of the men and women we have in uniform. I want to thank God that we have courageous men and women so willing to serve our nation in peacetime and in war. Webster's Dictionary defines a hero as a person of distinguished courage or ability, admired for their brave deeds or noble qualities. Those noble qualities include loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. These are the core values of the United States Army and which are exemplified in the lives and actions of the three men we honor today. I had the honor of dining with a large number of our nation's remaining Medal of Honor winners, and to a man, I have never experienced such a humble group of ordinary citizens who did extraordinary acts to warrant such recognition. They will tell you that there are countless more who acted just as courageously and faithfully that did not receive the recognition they have, yet deserve it no less. We have that single act of hero uh, heroism in Lieutenant Morgan, who in the heart or in the heat of the battle against the Viet Cong forces took heroic actions to save the lives of his fellow comrades despite being seriously injured himself. There are also those whose acts of courage are extended over a multitude of combat missions, time and again placing themselves into harm's way, not because they necessarily want to, none of us do, but because of the unspoken bond between the comrades in arms and the faithful dedication to the ideals of the United States. We have Staff Sergeant Dickerson, who flew countless missions over France, Germany, and Holland, his bomber again and again entering into the hellacious anti-aircraft fire which claimed so many lives of our aviators during World War II in order to complete their missions. And last but not least, Sergeant Brennan, who deployed to Afghanistan not once, but twice, each time engaging in heavy combat actions against a determined enemy, the Taliban, earning three Purple Hearts before ultimately being killed in action while leading a patrol, despite still recovering from wounds received from a previous engagement. To be quite honest, Webster's Dictionary of hero just doesn't do these three men's accomplishments any justice. Their sacrifices and their actions changed many men's lives in tremendous ways, both during their service and for those afterward throughout this, through to this day, inspiring today's soldiers, sailors, airmen and marine and coast guardsmen with their dedication, loyalty, duty, and honor. The Hall of Heroes is only a small token of our appreciation for your service, 
that some have criticized, some have refused to partake, and some could only dream of doing. But what you, Lieutenant Morgan, and Staff Sergeant Dickerson, and Sergeant Brennan did with pride and without reservation. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. And thank God we continue to have the brave men and women who voluntarily raised their right hand to defend the Constitution and the freedoms we hold so dear. May God bless you all. May God bless your families. And may God continue to bless these United States of America. Thank you. that Sergeant Major is, but I know two guys from the herd and one from the Marikel willing to go back, but we need a vehicle for our rucksacks. <laughs> Thank you. And that is, I've, I've read about the Sergeant Major, and it's incredible that we still have a, a dinosaur Vietnam veteran, because we're even in the reserves, and I was still, and we were dinosaurs. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Well, we're going to uh, start out with uh, introducing uh, the honorees for today. And Staff Sergeant Harry Dickerson, uh, Army Air Force, World War II, European Theater, Aerial Gunner, B-26, Marauder, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal with three silver oak leaves, father of United States Air Force veteran Kelly Dickerson. Harry was a Hey, I didn't know this too recently, Harry was a patient of Dr. Matt Crow, and Matt Crow wanted to be here so bad, Dr. Crow. And uh, he's the guy that, he, whenever he peeks in my office on fifth floor, when's the Hall of Heroes? When are you going to have that? When are you going to have that? And I love it. Even though I said, I don't have time right now, we're going to do it uh, a little bit later, we'll, we'll get there. But his persistence and dedication to honor a veteran that he thought should be recognized from uh, an attending physician, very young generation, but he really takes pride in uh, treating our veterans. So, man, I'm sorry you, uh, you couldn't be here, but uh, we'll get you a DVD. Sadly, Mrs. Dickerson recently passed away. I met her. Uh, last fall, and with Kelly, I knew, I knew Kelly is a veteran, and she needed heart surgery. And this was, we we're kind of looking at doing this around Veterans Day, and she was explaining she needs heart valve surgery. And I said, oh, you're not going to put off the heart valve surgery uh, for the Hall of Heroes. You go ahead and get that done, and then when you are, are back on your feet or have a ceremony. Sadly, she had some complications and she passed on and she's with Harry. As you know, I always give the Air Force veterans a hard time about their golf courses, <laughs> chow, <laughs> hotel-like barracks, <laughs> but I gained a new insight into World War II bombers with Harry's induction and also a phone call from a cousin of my mother that was a young nun when her brother, uh, Lieutenant Stephen Piezus, was declared MIA December 23, 1944. And his remains may have been located in 2007. We're like this right now, and I hope there's some closure. I immediately went to Amazon and bought two books about B-26s. I sure I went to Dickerson's because I never, you know, you heard of B-19s. Uh, uh, I talked to all the POWs uh, that are eligible for dental. And I go, always, when a POW comes in from World War II, I go, infantry or Air Corps? It's a no-brainer. It's one or the other. And it's just amazing reading about B-26s that I, none of the POWs I've ever met were with uh, B-26s. And... Uh, and I found out how they flew missions, and then I also found out that uh, the famous Memphis Bell, uh, which I believe is a B-19, we've heard about that. They flew first 
25 successful missions without losing an air crew. And the higher ups in the Air Force, for morale purposes, decided to take that crew and take them back stateside and put them on like a bond tour. And uh, then they kind of established for morale purposes 25 missions and you might get a chance to go home because this was really needed. 80% of bombers were shot down within their first three months in the European theater. During one mission of a B-26 Marauders in 1943, 10 of 11 were shot down. So it's a true miracle that Staff Sergeant Harry Dickerson could have survived 85 missions. And Dr. Crow brought in all the mission reports and he goes, look at this one, <laughs> look at this one. And he's uh, a history buff and uh, I just love that when you, you see that on uh, somebody young, enthusiastic like that. So uh, Kelly, can you come up and just, I know she's told me a good story about her dad and I, I'd like uh, her to come up and share experiences. Uh, Well, thank you, Dr. Hofer, for all the work you've done with the Hall of Heroes. It was great. And my family and I would like to thank Dr. Crow for nominating our dad, and we would like to thank the committee for nominating our dad with the induction into the Hall of Heroes. And we would also like to take, thank Teresa and the staff in the medical media department for all their great work they have done. This is really great. And the story I told Dr. Hofer when my dad was a tail gunner, he always sat in the back of the plane, and he just sat on the floor. Well, one day, he saw a pail, and so he decided to sit on the pail, and the pail was shot out from under him. And he always told us kids that if it wasn't for that pail, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was his story about World War II, so. Well, Kelly? Oh. We do have a wonderful display, and uh, we will uh, have some photos of the families uh, after the ceremony, and we can have you on the stage. It's a little tight in the hall, but after refreshments, we'll get all, all that uh, done, and we get a copy of the DVD, and you can send it to relatives in Michigan or wherever else. What other states did the Ohio Dickersons come from? Virginia. Ohio. Well, thanks for, okay. thanks for traveling. This is special for us. <laughs> Lieutenant Morgan. I love lieutenants. Did I mention that? I impersonated a lieutenant one time for two days in True Lie. I think I was an E3 or an E4. But you'd come in off a mission, you'd clean your weapon, turn in your gear, and I grabbed a uniform out of the pile, and it was a second lieutenant's. I'm a lieutenant for the next two days. I, uh, the first sergeant told me to take it off, and I go, Top, I'm a second lieutenant. And I went back and forth, well, what was he going to do? Send me back out to the field? He was going to do that in two days. I met a little Vietnamese girl at a PX by the combat center replacement, and uh, she right away, she knew I wasn't lieutenant. Before any soldier, you baby son, you know Dai Wee. <laughs> I go, me Dai Wee, me Dai Wee. And I said, you buku pretty, and I'd like to meet you later. So, <laughs> if you just throw them lines out when you're 19. So she, she told me she worked at Ranger Club. And if anybody's been in the Army, you know what Ranger Clubs, they had formed their own club because they got kicked out of every other club in true life. <laughs> so I showed up, not on a date, but I had the lieutenant bars, I had beads, I needed a haircut, and I walk in, and it says, no beads, you better get have a haircut. And I go, ah, what the heck, let's go have a beer anyway. And I walk in there, and I, she's there, and I got a beer, and then I start looking, and the Rangers are looking at me, and they know something's up. I go, nice meeting you. <laughs> that was it. That was, I eventually became a Navy lieutenant, legitimately. <laughs> so, Lieutenant, they are the backbone of the Army. Lieutenants 
and NCOs, they run the Army, the Marine Corps, and uh, other branches with different ranks, the Air Force and the Navy. They're the backbone. Not saying we don't need generals to guide us. <laughs> but the, the tough duties are done by, really by lieutenants in infantry units. And Lieutenant Morgan, we're proud to honor you today. And also your son, Major Brian Morgan, a West Point graduate that flew little birds with Army Special Oper Operations and won 60th Special Operations, which in uh, the movie Black Hawk Down, hosed down them bad guys when they were in Mogadishu and saved them. And uh, I know uh, I've been, he, he came up from down south on active duty and uh, wanted to say a few words. Uh, you're very proud of your father's uh, accomplishments. So, Major and Dad, Lieutenant, would you both come up here? On alums, Captain Jim Kurtz. Did, we, did uh, the other LT make it here? And Master Sergeant Philip Peters, UWROTC, First Sergeant, two tours with Big Red One. Taylor Quas for all of us. I didn't know we were going to have to speak today. <laughs> I'd like to thank each of you. I'd like to thank each of you for coming today. As you know, uh, veterans coming back from Vietnam weren't particularly well treated. We uh, were blamed for the political decisions of our political leaders. Fortunately, the young men and women serving today are not blamed for the consequences that they're put into. Uh, if I had a wish today, it would be that Harry and Josh would be here. Harry and I have been fortunate to live long lives. Josh, I wish he was here because it's extremely tragic when a young man or woman loses their life. But thank you very, very much for coming. It's a great honor. And I uh, thank you to you for coming today. I have to agree with Dr. Hofer that uh, lieutenants and NCOs are the backbone of the Army. We majors, we just sit back, drink coffee, and make lieutenants' lives miserable. So. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished visitors, families, and friends. My name is Major Brian Morgan. It's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce my father, James Morgan, as the next inductee into the Wisconsin Hall of Heroes. Now, you can read your programs and his biography and get an idea of where he's been, what he's done during his life, and during his military career. I'd like to take a moment and talk about who Jim Morgan is from mine and my family's perspective. I've known him for the past 35 years, so I think I've known to come, come to know him pretty well. For one thing, he's an outstanding father. One of my earliest and best memories that I have, and I think my sister has, is uh, of him throwing us up in the air. We, and we were pretty small, and he was a pretty big guy, and he could chuck us pretty high up there. The, uh, the only bad thing is, he, his catching skills aren't all that high. <laughs> I don't think there's any permanent damage to my sister, but my, I've got all spots in my memory that's kind of gone. <laughs> Where was I? Um, <laughs> on a serious note, as a father, he is and he was and still is totally dedicated to our family. He would stop by school to play kickball with us on his way to work second shift in the can factory in lacrosse. He'd organize sports days complete with a helicopter stack display and army patch souvenir hunt. He would make every sporting event my sister and I had that he could and be one of the most vocal people in the stands. He supported my dreams of being a motocross star and my, love, my sister's love of horses. Even today, he bends over backwards to support us and his dedication hasn't diminished a bit. He's also a great husband. He's, he and my mother have set a great example for uh, what a marriage should be. This coming August, so I've been married for over 40 years most of which without gunplay, so they've got to have been doing something right. <laughs> now 
not only is he dedicated to his family, but contributes greatly to the local community. When my sister and I were in school, he was constantly engaged on what was going on in our lives, but he didn't intercede too much to, uh, to bother us and let us learn our own life lessons. He's also a member that he was also a member of the school board and is now a member of the local Lions Club and has helped to organize local community events. He's also been involved in the Wisconsin Challenge Academy, sponsoring at-risk teens and help, helping them get their lives back on track. He's also very enthusiastic about spending time outdoors and gardening. Over his lifetime, he's pl probably planted over a million pine trees. Allison and I would know because we probably planted half of them. <laughs> He'd constantly tell us, these will provide shade for your kids one day. At the time, kids were the furthest things from our mind. But look at us today. Allison's got two, and I've got my daughter, Estelle. Those trees should be just big enough by now to provide shade for them. One aspect of his life that he's very proud of and that we as his family never got to see growing up was his military service. Growing up, we had a hallway, hallway where Dad hung his medals and citations for them. I remember reading them often as a kid, but the actions on the citations didn't really sink in until I was in the Army myself. I can tell you that what's on an Army Award citation is only half the story. Also, having been to combat, I have a much greater appreciation for what he did. And my experience as a pilot doesn't even compare to what he's had to go through on a daily basis as an infantryman. But the bottom line is, being able to think clearly and operate with a purpose while you've got that rush of excitement, fear, anger, and confusion coursing through your body is essential for staying alive and for mission success. Not only do that, did he do that remarkably, he, did, he always led from the front and set the example for his men to follow. Before I close, I'd like to read the citation of the Silver Star Award. And remember, what's on the citation is only half the story of what actually happened that day. The Silver Star is awarded to 2nd Lieutenant James S. Morgan, C Company, 1st Battalion, 28th Infantry, 1st Infantry Brigade, 1st Infantry Division. Date, 15 January 1966. Theater, Republic of Vietnam. Awarded for gallantry in action. Second Lieutenant Morgan distinguished himself on 15 January 1966 as a platoon leader of a unit on a battalion attack in the well-fortified village of Bon Cap, Republic of Vietnam. At approximately 11.30 hours, the reconnaissance platoon attached to his company was suddenly attacked by a Viet Cong force deploy deploying small arms fire and command detonated mines. Second Lieutenant Morgan volunteered to effect contact and, upon reaching the reconnaissance platoon, found the platoon leader seriously wounded and the platoon sergeant dying. He immediately reorganized the reconnaissance platoon and personally assisted in the care of six wounded personnel. When the Viet Cong force opened fire, Second Lieutenant Morgan, with complete disregard for his personal safety, charged across an open field and, although painfully wounded, successfully silenced the position. Second Lieutenant Morgan's heroic actions inspired his comrades to increase their efforts, which contributed significantly to the defeat of the Viet Cong force. His unimpeachable valor in close combat was in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflects great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army by direction of the President. In closing, I'd like to thank the Wisconsin Hall of Heroes for bestowing my father with this great honor. And you, Dad, congrats and thanks for everything. Lieutenant, where did you get those glasses in that picture when you were worried about Silver Star? <laughs> Army issue, they usually call them birth control glasses. It's pretty ugly. No, but that's, that's what they issue. The kids today, I'm sure they buy their own. Uh, or, uh, thank God, in Iraq and that, I see them wearing uh, the high tech. And uh, I've seen pictures where uh, troops are wounded and 
that is not shattered, with, uh, whatever they're called. What, what do they call them downstairs, sir? What do they call those glasses that... Ballistics. Can you shoot a... Can, you, can that take an AK-47 round? Okay. <laughs> Shrapnel only. Okay. Nine eleven changed the world we live in forever. Patriotism, loss of so many Americans, and the anger that anyone would do this so savagely and cowardly to Americans caused many young men and women to join the military. Sergeant Josh Brennan is of this generation that today represents the best this country has and gives hope. Peace someday. I'm sorry. He represents himself, the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and all the men and women that were wounded or died putting their lives on the line protecting us in a chaotic, very dangerous world today. Josh comes from a military family, just like the Morgans and the Dickersons. His father, Mike Brennan, served as an Army MP. And we don't like MPs all the time, Mike. <laughs> but he's, Mike served in Desert Storm and protects us today as a Madison police officer. Mike, I knew this honoring of Josh would be difficult. And the VA medical media that carefully copied pictures and citations and a special letter from Josh's commanding officer worked so closely with you and I'm so honored to do this for Josh. You and your family, I can <clears throat> only hope this provides some comfort. Jim and Agnes Napolis and Dave Kais, both Vietnam veterans with the herd, as the 173rd lovingly refers themselves. And we've all felt like we've come to know Josh by meeting you and your sharing information and stories honoring Josh and his generation of Brennan, brave men and women protecting us. Is, is Don Owens here? There's one, there's one other VA employee that's with the herd. Mike, uh, please come up and uh, sh share some. Get a second, Dave guys. What do you say? I'm going to start by um, thanking Doc Hofer, Teresa, um, for all that they've done to put together the ceremony today. Um, I got to meet Doc Hofer. Um, uh, probably six, seven months ago, um, started talking on the internet about his plans on doing the uh, Hall of Heroes here in Madison. I didn't quite understand at the time the magnitude of the uh, event and um, all of the heroes that have been honored before us. One day I came up and observed the Hall of Heroes in the hallway here at the VA hospital and realized what an honor it is for Josh to be inducted into this group of fine soldiers. I didn't realize until yesterday in speaking with Doc Holfer that he was going to ask me to actually say a few words and say a few things about Josh and everything that's happened. So I'm going to do my best. It was following 9-11-2001. Um, Josh was a sophomore in high school. And he came to me and he said, Dad, 
I just want to serve my country. And although I never told him at the time, I was just so proud. I was just so proud that a kid who should be worried about getting their driver's license, hanging out with friends, you know, going on a date, going to the movies. He's thinking about wanting to serve his country and serve others. I know at that time that um, and he's a special kid and he was certainly the kind of guy that thought of others. Um, when he graduated from high school, um, we had talked about different branches of the service and advantages and disadvantages of different things that he could do within the military. And he said, you know, he's like, Dad, I just want to do something that's a challenge. I don't want to have it easy. And we brought up different things that he could do along the way. And he just wasn't sure if some of my ideas of being an MP like I was, or some things like that would be challenging enough for him. And uh, so when he went to sign up, he um, originally found out that all those positions in the military police and security police and the Air Force and various branches of security services were all filled up. So he called me up one day and he said, um, Dad, I joined the Airborne Infantry. I'm going to be going to the infantry and I'm going to be jumping on airplanes. I didn't know how to react at the time and um, I was a little bit shocked, but I was very proud and I always supported him in everything that he did. He um, went into the military, 19 years old, right out of high school. And he joined the 173rd Airborne in Vicenza, Italy. It wasn't long before he was there that we learned that the unit was going to be deploying. When he deployed his first tour of duty to Afghanistan and served there for 12 months. During that tour of duty, we weren't able to talk very much. But when we were, he shared some pretty scary stories with me that really um, were hard for me to deal with. Shared stories of almost being overrun by the Taliban at their position in Afghanistan where he described rocket propelled grenades going over his head so close that he could reach up and touch them. He sent me a picture. Bullet holes in the wood right next to his head where he just missed by inches being shot in the head by the Taliban during one attack. During that course and tour of duty, he was awarded the Bronze Star of Valor for a firefight that ensued when one of his friends, Lieutenant Hines, was killed. They'd gone to a small village to look for Taliban bomb builders. They had killed four of their guys the week before in a bridge that blew up. They found the people that they were looking for, and unfortunately during the battle, Lieutenant Hines was killed. Josh didn't tell me much about what happened that day, but as a result of his valor, he was awarded the Bronze Star of Valor. During his second deployment to Afghanistan, once again returned and returned to an area near the Pakistani border where they call basically the Valley of Hell. It's an area in, Pakistan, or in Afghanistan near the Pakistani border where soldiers had not been or any of our military since 2006 when four Navy SEALs were attacked and three of them were killed. Um, while serving there, Josh was injured in September of 2007 
when he was shot in the leg. Unfortunately, at that time, he was supposed to be getting out of the Army on September 23rd, and he was supposed to be home for my daughter Brittany's birthday. He wanted to stay, and he wanted to serve with his guys because he said, Dad, if I were to get out of the military and something happened to one of my friends, I just wouldn't feel right about that. I remember getting the call that day in September 2007 when I was at work from the State Department telling me that Josh had been shot, shot in the leg and injured, stating that it had been 12 hours and they had not gotten him out of the combat zone yet. He told me that his injuries were serious, but they couldn't give me any more information at the time. Um, as you know, I mean, as family members, we were completely worried, sick, and didn't know what Josh's condition might be. And I was especially worried by the fact that there had been 12 hours go by and he hadn't received medical attention. <laughs> Old Josh. About 9 o'clock that night, he calls me on the phone. Cheerful as could be, and says, Hey, Dad, did you hear I got shot in the leg today? <laughs> he made it sound like he fell and skinned his knee. He said, But I'm all right. I'm going to be okay. He said, uh, It's just a flesh wound, Dad, and through and through. He said, didn't hit the bone. He said, uh, got me in the calf, though, he said. But he said, um, you know what? In a couple weeks, I'm going to be back there with my guys. I urged him to take his time and make sure that it was all healed so that he would go back and be 100%. He said, Dad, I, I think we'll be a couple weeks, and that's all. And I asked him where he was, and he said, I was just at the clinic being worked on, and I'm just on a payphone outside the clinic. I later learned that um, in their position, they were attacked by multiple Taliban who attacked their position from three different locations and had them pinned down on the top of a mountain. Josh grabbed a machine gun from one of his privates and fired at the Taliban, allowing he and other soldiers to jump to safety and try to get behind cover during that Josh was shot in the leg. What I didn't realize until later, which he didn't necessarily tell me, was that he was bandaged up and continued to fight for 12 hours after being injured. They called the helicopter in after the 12 hours and the battle was done to try to get Josh out, and he asked, why are you doing that? I don't need a helicopter. And at that time, he led the guys as the point man and led his whole unit and led him out of the mountains and back down to the base camp to safety. Lieutenant Colonel Lawson, who I spoke with after Josh's funeral, said it was at that time, on that day, that we knew we had a real hero up there because after being injured like that and fighting so heroically, he led his men in battle and still led them out, even though he was injured. When Josh was killed, he was on a mission where they were going to search for Taliban in a village where there were shivel, what they call high-value targets. The colonel had flown into the village that day and landed on the rooftop of one of the tribal elders' houses to try to send a message to them that they were not going to tolerate the Taliban shooting at our soldiers from these villages and hiding out in the homes anymore. Following the colonel meeting with the Taliban leader, Josh and many other soldiers were set up in security positions around the village. Josh didn't need to be there that day. He volunteered. 
his group of guys was back and they were on Western relaxation taking a break. One of the other guys was in some training that day. Josh volunteered to go for him. Not only did he volunteer to go for him, but he volunteered to be the point man and take the lead position. Josh was always the guy that took the lead position and was always the guy that volunteered to be the point man. They were leaving the village that day. Josh, being the lead man, was the guy that got hit the most. He drew fire from approximately 22 Taliban that had set up an ambush. He had been hit about nine times and hit with a rock bell grenade that didn't explode. Some of his friends, seeing this, saw that the Taliban had stripped Josh of his weapon, rucksack, and helmet, and were carrying his body away into the woods. I can only imagine what would have happened if those soldiers would not have ran up to save him. Sergeant Sal Gallanta, Eric Gallardo, and three other soldiers went into fire to save my son that day. Five soldiers were shot multiple times in their ballistic body armor, helmet, legs, and feet, running to get to Josh and to try to save him from the hands of the Taliban. When they got to Josh, he was still alive, and he was talking, and he was pretty beat up. They were comforting, comforting Josh and telling him that he was going to come home to Wisconsin. To be with his dad. and work with me on the police department someday. And he said, I know. Josh was a fighter. He never gave up. And he was still confident, although he was hurt so bad, that he was going to be here with us. And he was going to hang in there. About six hours later, after getting out, Josh died from his wounds. As a result of that, Sal Garanta, who led the charge against the Taliban, has been put in for the Congressional Medal of Honor. For his heroic efforts, I hope that he receives it. September of 2008, my family and I Ten of us, in total, went to Afghan. I'm sorry, went to Italy upon the return of Josh's unit to meet all the soldiers coming home from Afghanistan. What an experience that was! Although our son wasn't returning, we wanted to go there and tell them, "Thank you for their service and welcome them home." I got to meet Sal, shake his hand, and tell him personally how much I appreciated him giving me my son back. Although Josh had been killed, he allowed me to have my son back and give him a proper burial. And I will always, always be grateful to him and all the guys for the, everything that they did to go up there and help my son. Again, I want to thank Doc Holfer for everything that he's done with this ceremony. Teresa, the people from maintenance, the staff from the hospital, 
everyone that has gone above and beyond in putting on this ceremony and especially for honoring my son for his service to his country and his sacrifice. Thank you. I was reading a book that I was given uh, to from a Marine when I was at Bethesda Medical Center for a Navy dental course two weeks ago. He, he's from Evansville. I reported in after first days of class, and I reported in the Marine Corps the liaison office. I said, you got, a, you got a Marine from Wisconsin? And I, I read about him. And sure enough, he's there. And he, he, he lost both his legs below the knees in Afghanistan. Mike knows the family of the Marine, and I'm like, it's it's karma, whatever. So I got his phone number. He's at the Malone house. The book he gave me, and Dave Kaj, who's a double amputee, really wants to meet this Marine. Uh, please be seated again. And uh, the, the book is about a Marine, Eddie, Eddie Breeze, he was the first double amputee since the Korean War early in Vietnam. And he gave him prostheses and said, stand up. And he goes, how? They go, stand up, because we don't know either. They forgot, just like they forget during wars. So we're going to get you in touch. But one of the quotes in the chapter, it says, Marines don't cry, but sometimes their eyeballs sweat. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm going to add that. That Marines, paratroopers, MPs, medics, and everybody, they don't cry, but their eyeballs sweat sometimes. And Military Art of Purple Heart uh, tracked me down <laughs> through email, and they wanted to present uh, you a Purple Heart uh, plaque. They have their convention going on up, you guys are up in Two Rivers? Two Rivers. Two rivers. And we couldn't change this, but they came down from Two Rivers uh, to present this to you. And then, uh, come on up. What? What the whole? Come on, girls. <laughs> and Eric is the commander of the chapter. Okay. Eric, you can come over to Mike. I'm Eric Nickenen. I'm the commander of the military order of Purple Heart in Western Wisconsin. Excuse me. This is uh, honorable Josh Brennan as a Purple Heart recipient. And this is given by the Military Order of Purple Heart in honoring Joshua. Thank you. And uh, Mike, can you want to stay up here for uh, reading the letter? Or? Jim and Airborne and Agnostopolis. We, like I said, we've kind of felt like we know Josh through you, Mike. And uh, there, it's rare that a soldier this young gets so highly decorated. Three brown stars, two purple hearts at, at, at such an early age. And when, when Josh was killed, the commanding officer could not return from Afghanistan, if I have this right, and he wrote a letter, and he had his father
right, he's spirit trooper. He can jump down there and pick it up. Can you do a PLF? <laughs> and the, the father of the company commander, who's a retired Army Colonel, Special Forces, drove up from Florida and presented this letter to Mike, uh, honoring Josh. And Mike shared it with me. He shared it with Dave, Jim. Our eyeballs sweated, and they might again. But Jim, could you read that letter? I'll attempt. These unofficial military issue. Oh, we got reading glasses too up there. <laughs> Letter states, sir, I wish that it were under better circumstances that I write this letter. But your son was such a fine man that I thought it necessary to take the time to tell you just how much he influenced those around him. From the fall of 2004 to the spring of 2006, it was my extreme honor and privilege to be a member of the 1st Platoon Calcs Battle Company, 2nd and 503rd Airborne. As his platoon leader, I was able to work closely with your son day in and day out. I not only watched him grow as a man, but I was also able to observe the effect he had on all his family of brothers in arms. When I came to the Celts in October of 04, Josh was still a private first class, and one of the two platoon machine gunners. Unlike most platoons, our gunners, our gunners weren't the biggest, strongest guys of the bunch, but rather those who were the best marksmen and could consistently perform under pressure. Josh must have been, always been a natural leader, though it wasn't obvious to me from the beginning because he was more quiet and reserved than the rest of his squad. However, when he spoke, his peers listened, and they never failed to follow the example he would set. <laughs> of our numerous patrols in Afghanistan, the platoon sergeant and I would rotate the squads conducting daily patrols in order to provide sufficient rest to the men. However, weapons squad was not afforded that luxury because they carried the most firepower in the platoon. As a result, Josh was an intricate member of each combat patrol that left our safe house in Baylor. This alone is a testament to not only his personal strength, but his character. I can honestly say I had never once heard him complain, though it seemed a popular thing to do amongst his peers. Although I already held Josh in highest regards, it wasn't long afterwards he was promoted to specialist that I came to respect him even more. At dawn on September 1st, 2005, Second Squad and myself linked up after an all-night movement with our then company commander, Captain Cloper, who was executing a separate patrol which Josh was a part of. It was after the link-up had been affected that Captain Cloper informed me that our company fire support officer, Lieutenant Eric Hines, had been killed in a brief firefight with their local Taliban. Captain Cloper continued to say that for 45 minutes it took for that medevac bird to arrive, Josh continued to perform CPR on Derek. Though he was gone, Josh refused to let go. I was left with the impression that as long as Josh felt he could make a difference, he would continue to give his all. This is something that has been characteristic of your son for as long as I have known him. It wasn't the, I wasn't the only one in his chain of command that thought the world of Josh. Your son was the only junior enlisted soldier in the platoon that had been recommended for the Bronze Star Medal and had it approved. I believe this is due to the insistence and support of Captain Cooper and our then battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Stanley. Obviously, Josh, Josh stood out among his peers, not only to me, but to those who rarely had contact with him. 
For the year we were in Afghanistan, once a day in our little makeshift gym in Belo, Josh and I would go to PT together. We talked about home and our aspirations for the future. On more than one occasion, he had mentioned his then girlfriend, Melissa, and wondered what the future held for their relationship. However, he more often spoke of moving home after this time in the Army and was when his time in the Army was done and working in law enforcement with his dad. Josh was the kind of man who always thought of family first, which was all the more flattering to the Celts, since he absolutely considered each of us his brother. Although I left the Celts at the end of the deployment, I was able to watch his continuing development from next door. I was extremely proud when Josh was promoted to sergeant and moved to the position of fire team leader. From this position, his knowledge, experience, and heart undoubtedly helped mold new members into the Celts, into men. It has been said too many times before that the world is a lesser place for losing a certain soldier, and it is no less true in the case of Josh. I know I am not only a better soldier for knowing your son, but much more importantly, a better man. I will forever be honored to have known and served with your son, not only as one of my soldiers, but also as a brother and a true friend. My heart and prayers are with you. Sincerely, Captain Mark H. E. Bush. Last time we had this, we had a little contest between the Marines and the paratroopers. <laughs> so, Staff Sergeant Kevlitz, sir, <laughs> would you like to start it off? Uh, First Sergeant Christensen went one, two, three. You know what comes next. Okay, stand up, Gilly. <laughs> one, two, three! Not <laughs> uh, loud enough, Staff Sergeant. <laughs> Now I'm going to stay One, two, three, ooh-ah! Airborne. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's why uh, paratroopers and Marines aren't allowed in bars together. <laughs> Chaplain, can you come up and give us a benediction? Or the MPs are called in. To walk with us, to be with us, to protect us. I ask you to be with Harry and Josh right now and just reach down and put your arms around them and hug them for us as we honor them today and we honor their gift to us. I ask you to help Jim to feel your presence and your love reaching down to him at this very moment and touching him for that gift you've given to us and to their families and friends for the honor that we have received today by being in their presence and walking with them. We ask you, Lord, for you also to touch all of our armed forces and servicemen that have served our country and walked with us each day to protect us and to be with us, that we may have the courage to make the difference to each of them as they come back, as they come to our hospital, as they come to our guard, our reserves, wherever they may be on the street, in the restaurants, that we can say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for them, and thank you for being with us to protect us and walk with us always. So be with us all, and may the peace of God that passes our understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge of you and the gift you've given us of this country. And may you continue to bless this country and bless our lives. Amen. Just before we, uh, re please be seated, before we uh, retire to the colors, next weekend is Memorial Day weekend, Monday, May 25th. Memorial Day weekend was not invented just for the world's largest rock fest. So just as a reminder, I'd like to have First Sergeant Peterson and Staff Sergeant Gillitzer read the names of those killed in action from Dane County, and then we will retire the colors. Would you come forward? And then stay, sir. 
And family members, after the ceremony, we have you here. We're going to take some pictures. And then there will be refreshments in, in the back. And I don't know about anybody but, like me, but I need a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so first, first sorry. Please stand. The following Dane County soldiers have given all in service of our country. From Operation Enduring Freedom, Sergeant Joshua Brennan. Specialist Robert Cook. Sergeant Daniel Thompson. From Operation Iraqi Freedom, Sergeant Mark Maida. Chief Warrant Officer 2, Joshua Scott. Sergeant First Class, Matthew Cading. Specialist Rachel Hugo. Good afternoon. Marines from Dane County killed in action in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Lance Corporal Shane O'Donnell. Staff Sergeant Chad Simon. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, uh, standing. And I got a, one of the color guard that uh, we, Master Sergeant, uh, connecting me with really quickly is a new to be second lieutenant in two days. Uh, can we call you Butter Bar or Lieutenant, Mr. Clement? But he's carrying, he's going to retire the Army colors. And I hope you have an appreciation for what we do at the VA and carry this as a newly commissioned lieutenant and the leader in the Army. Color Guard, post colors. As you were, return the colors. Victory. Oh. Thanks for uh, serving. Thanks for participating, listening to me rambling. And I uh, tell you, this is such an honor. Uh, we haven't ever done, uh, inducted three, but we haven't done it for a few years. And uh, Staff Sergeant Gillitzer was very instrumental in supporting Air Force. And it, it shows that all the committee, Staff Sergeant Gillitzer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Des Moines, uh, Air Force retired some kind of master sergeant? Good enough. <laughs> Did I promote you? Jeff Unger and uh, Chief Petty Officer PJ O'Neill. I screen them. They are the ones that sort them out and I close the doors and get out of there. And uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful way to, uh, to honor veterans and uh, their living in, in forever uh, with them here in the Hall of Heroes in Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you very much.